Today we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to tell you some things that you may not know about me. Hi everybody, I'm Jim Deardorff and this is Detroit DIY. Let's dig into this. I first found my passion for wood and woodworking when I was a young boy. I was in 4-H and for 4-H we had to build a project and I selected to build a corner shelf. They gave us a little template that we took home, we laid it out on the wood and drew it all out, cut it out with a jigsaw, sanded it, nailed it, screwed it together. I thought it was awesome. Just awesome. When it was all finished, I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, that's amazing. I made that. I never saw it again. I don't know what happened to it. It probably, my dad probably put it straight in the trash can because it probably was nowhere near as awesome as I actually thought it was. But irregardless, it gave me the insight to be able to see that I liked putting my hands on wood and, and building things. So with those interests, I became interested in a lot of things wood. When I graduated high school, I jumped right in my car and I moved to Naples, Florida. My very first job in Naples, Florida was at a condominium called Park Plaza. It was a 20-story building and I got a job there as a laborer for a plastering company. It was AAA plastering. And what they had me doing was pushing around wheelbarrows of cement to the stucco team and they it was busy it was hard work it was wheelbarrows are heavy i learned how to push a wheelbarrow full of cement that's a whole learning curve on its own uh, most of the times if you push one with dirt in it they don't want to tip over when you lean them the dirt stays in place the cement moves around i don't know how many i dumped over my first day but it, it was more than a couple after that i got the hang of it and could push around a wheelbarrow full of cement no problem about two months into that, they moved me over to the swing crew. We were prepping the building for the application of the stucco. We were priming the poured cement areas. The block areas, the, the concrete block areas did not need to be primed. The stucco would stick to that just fine. However, any of the poured concrete, it would not. It had to be primed. We were prepping the windows because all of that cement would get sprayed on and then it would get troweled out. It was a pretty unique, it was a, a nice learning curve and it was all cement, metal studs and cement. So it wasn't really quite where I wanted to be. So it didn't take me too long to realize that that's not what I wanted to do. And I kind of moved on from that. I moved to Metro Detroit about 15 years ago. And when I got here, I saw some opportunities that I wanted to take advantage of. At that point in time, I cracked down, I studied, and I got my residential builder's license in the state of Michigan. I'll hold my finger over my address because it is my home, but here is my residential builder's license for the state of Michigan. I've been very active in the construction industry for many years. In all aspects of it, I've seen more homes go together. I've seen entire communities go from a section of woods to sewer, roads, city water, you name it. I have seen it take place. I've worked for Toll Brothers. I've worked for the Bonita Bay Group. I've been around Pulte Homes. I've been around U.S. Homes. A lot of these large home builders seen how they do things, learned from them, and was able to take a lot of that information and put it together to build a knowledge base that's just absolutely incredible in my opinion. I think one of my heroes as far as woodworking and home construction and so on and so forth goes has to be Norm Abrams. He's been a part of our lives, my life and everybody's life. Who doesn't know who Norm Abrams is? For many, many years when he first came on this old house, you know, I thought he was a just a carpenter, but it, he's obviously very well versed in woodworking and, and in many things and understands wood maybe better than a lot of people will ever understand wood. And I think that's what I really like so much about Norm is just his wide, his vast knowledge base. I think through all the contracting that I've done that, you know, and I think any contractor would, I have a favorite job. 
And that favorite job was a barn that I did here in the Metro Detroit area. It was a little dilapidated, but not falling down. It wasn't, you know, the most beautiful barn in the world. However, the owner of that barn wanted to do something pretty spectacular with it. And he wanted to tear the roof off, leave the bottom block structure, and rebuild the roof to make the second floor more usable than it was. And he wanted to do this in, with all Douglas fir. He wanted a five truss roof system. He wanted it to look like that it was an old church inside. It was all done with Douglas fir, and it was absolutely gorgeous, and it was just such a pleasure to work on this building. We put a metal roof on it, and and it was just, it was amazing. I'll pop a picture up here of just me standing in the window um, as some of the roofing work was going on. But it was an amazing job, and it probably has to be number one in my book of jobs that I've done. At a very young age, I kind of fell in love with cars. Not just any cars, but I fell in love with the muscle cars, the 69 and 70, 71 Chevelles and Novas and El Caminos and all that kind of stuff. And I learned a lot about these cars then. I worked on them, I owned them, I absolutely loved them. So I guess you could say I'm a bit of a gearhead. And, you know, so a lot of my spare time wasn't spent woodworking or doing any of that. But I discovered early on that I really liked working with my hands, whether it be working on, you know, a, a house or working on a car. I, I really loved those older cars. I still do today. I think they're amazing. I don't think any of the newer cars, as far as looks, even compare to what they had back then and why they strayed so far from them, I'll never know. Throughout my time working on cars, I've restored three of them. I'll put a picture of one of them up for you to check out. I've had a 1971 El Camino that I absolutely loved. I had a 1970 Chevelle that I absolutely loved. I had a 1971 Cuda that was an amazing car and I wish I would have never sold that one. And I fully restored a 1983 Chevy pickup with the help of some great friends. And then throughout all of that, how can you love these cars, do burnouts all the time, and just have such a great time doing it and not want to be involved in some form of racing? I have a ton of background in drag racing and I also have some road racing experience that I truly adored the people that were around me for this and that brought me into this and and it just helped me grow as a person it helped me grow as a team and it, as far as the racing is concerned i think it's probably one of the highlights of my life and one of the best things that i've done i wouldn't trade it for anything and it was just an amazing time. The racing that we did, some road course racing that was from the 24 Hours of Lemons, and we did that at Gingerman Raceway here in Michigan. And it was just, it was just a blast. If you get a chance or if it's something that you've always wanted to do, I suggest you do it. You're not going to find a better outlet for yourself to relax, to kick back, and to just clear your head than climbing in a race car. And... It's a thrill a minute. One of my greatest pastimes is fishing. I absolutely love fishing. Even if I don't catch fish, I mean, they call it fishing for a reason and not catching, right? That's what I've always been told. But I do, I absolutely love fishing. I love to get out on my boat, just either by myself or with some friends, it doesn't matter. If I've got a fishing pole in the water, I am just ecstatically happy. It's relaxing, it's mind clearing, and for me, it's probably the best way to reset my mind, rethink things, and, and just kind of get lost in the moment. And everybody needs that now and then. And for me, it's fishing that does it. And it doesn't matter, like I say, if I catch a fish or if I don't catch a fish. Of course, we all want to catch a fish. But if not, then that's fine too. In fact, I did a video a little while back. I'll put a link right up above here to it on um, one of the fishing trips that I took and I had some buddies on the way but I took a few minutes 
before they got there I jumped on the boat I went out and I made a quick video just to show some of the fish in this lake that we were catching and and some of the sizes of them these this lake is that I usually go to where my cottage is at is very very um, productive it has a lot of fish they're not super hard to catch and it has some monsters in it for the species around here and I'm gonna try my best next year to get myself a state record fish out of this lake or at least be a master angler fish the next thing I'm going to tell you about is a little tough for me because it was a huge setback about four years ago um, springtime my stomach just started killing me it was devastatingly painful it wore me down it made me just not want to do anything the pain was unbelievable the doctors that I went to could find nothing wrong by the time fall had arrived I started feeling better so it was about an entire summer of pain I went through that winter feeling pretty good the next spring early summer the pain started again and I wound up in the emergency room at that point in time they sent me through a CAT scan and discovered that my intestines were inflamed through more tests they discovered that I had Crohn's disease which is very very rare for a 55 year old person to come to to contract Crohn's it's just not something that happens it's a young man's disease young woman's disease once you're into your 30s or your 40s if you don't have Crohn's you're probably and you shouldn't come down with Crohn's it's something that happens to a younger person so it was very strange that this all happened to me um, if you know someone with Crohn's it can be extremely painful so if they're you know your mind your mind says let's go let's go do this let's go but your stomach your guts your just the pain sometimes the instability will it will just knock that right in the dirt I mean you you could feel as motivated as you want in your head but sometimes it just doesn't happen for me there were some struggles there were some complications along with the Crohn's and they were not able to get me on a medication right away until some other things got resolved um, some inflammation issues and and just some more tests and some more things need to be done and and it was kind of a horrible waiting period I now use a medication called Stellara that helps to control the inflammation in my intestines and it, it blocks my immune system so I have to be careful with illnesses colds any type of flu or infections or anything like that could be devastating to me I am in fact just getting over the first cold that I have gotten since I've been on Stellaro and that cold was treated with steroids and antibiotics and, and an inhaler to help my body fight this off because my immune system just can no longer do it the Crohn's also changed the way that I do things it hurt me a little bit in business relations because I would tell someone that I would be there on this day at this time to do a job to bid a job and the the I would wake up that morning and just be buckled over in pain and I couldn't do it so people started to think that you know I wasn't dependable and I wasn't you know and and a lot of people don't understand Crohn's and that's kind of why I've, I've put it in here it's not that I wasn't dependable I couldn't go out the door I, I just couldn't do it the the pain was that devastating that you can't just put on a smiley face and, and even though you call them and say hey look you know I just I can't do it. it it doesn't matter to them in some instances people look at that stuff differently and it, it made life 
tough for me for a little while. I had to really back off of the work that I was doing, slow everything down, um, and, and just kind of focus on myself at that point in time and not so much, you know, helping people do what I want to do, which is a shame because helping people is what I've always enjoyed doing. And it wasn't always about money. It wasn't always about any of that. It was more about helping people. And that's kind of how this YouTube channel started. My son convinced me to start this YouTube channel. And the premises behind it was to help people. When I first started making my videos, and still today, a lot of my videos are longer than what the YouTube norm is. And that's because they're tutorials. And I make these tutorials so that people can see the full process. There's no fast motion. There's no. I try to make all my pinpoints spot on to the exact things that people would need to know. Obviously, I can't hit it all or I can't answer every question. But the whole basis of this YouTube channel is to help people. In closing, guys, I just want to say thank you to everyone for subscribing to this channel, for all your comments for everything that you've done to help this channel grow and for me to reach more people. The more likes that you give a video, the more people it'll reach and the more people I can help. That's all we got for this time. Next week, we're going to fix something, cut something, do something like that. We'll have a good time. If you enjoyed yourself, click on one of those two videos. They're going to pop up next to me. And remember to always respect the power of your power tools. We'll see you soon.